we're in the middle of a, a little series that, that uh, kind of got inspired by Jana's last Sunday. She preached a great sermon that was just the, the thing that she needed to say before she left. And, um, and John said, hey, wouldn't it be a great idea if we did that? Except we each have two weeks uh, in a row to do that in, and we're not leaving. So I know there was some confusion about that. I figured out uh, John is not done preaching. He is not retiring. He is not in uh, San Diego golfing because he's never coming back. He's down there golfing because he wants to go down and golf. Um, and I did a little bit of math, and I think I have somewhere between 500 and 1,000 sermons left in me. So, so I'm sorry these two will not be the end. I will not just recycle them over and over and over for the rest of the time that you uh, – have me. Um, and so uh, this was also a trick for me because I never start with what I want to say to you all. I always start with a biblical text and then I see what God wants to say through it uh, to me and, and then I share that with you all and hopefully God shows up in the midst of all that and does some cool stuff. And so I was thinking if I was going to preach on just two texts, like let's say it was I was uh, able to preach in some church for only two weeks. Which text was I going to take? And, and that's always challenging, too. It, when a pastor says to you, like, hey, come preach and preach on whatever you want. I mean, the Bible's big, man. There's a lot of stuff in there. Could you narrow it down a little bit? Um, so I decided one from the Old Testament, one from the New. And um, the two passages that have most shaped my life and spoken um, – to me, and I and I think they they provide a really cool foundation for just walking out the faith. Um, from my perspective, is is David and Goliath, which is First Samuel uh, seventeen, and the woman at the well, which is John chapter four. So today we'll do David and Goliath. You probably heard some things about this story. You may know it inside and out, but I I ask that you would bear with me on it because I think there's some new stuff in there. Um, and then next week we'll do the woman at the well, but. Um, what I love about David and Goliath isn't just that it's an underdog story. I mean, everybody loves the underdog mm -hmm. story and the little guy taking down the big guy and uh, and God showing up in the midst of that. And that's that's very cool. But um, what I have grown fond of about this story is that it um, it offers a perspective, a way to see things. Um, David sees things very very differently than everybody else in that story. And how we view things, how we view especially the challenges and opportunities and um, the days of our lives will radically transform how we build them out. Um, that's kind of what faith does. And um, and I know for me this is this is true. Um, I was actually brought up very recently. I was listening to sports radio. I do that a lot. And, um, and I heard an interview with Earl Thomas. And they were asking him about obstacles and failures in his career as a as a pro athlete and um, how he kind of deals with that. And um, he said, you know, I don't see failure as as something that drags me down. It, it it it's actually a step on the way to greatness. It points out one more way that I could be better, so that I can I can actually move towards something and, and improve some area of my game. And, and it struck me that I have lived myself with a fear of failure for a long time. And so I have a tendency to get thoroughly trained and to learn everything I can before I do something because then when I do it, I want to succeed at it. And if I fail at it, it's probably something I'm not supposed to be doing and I don't want to ever do it again because that's not very fun. Failing is not what in my wheelhouse of things I like to do. And I realized that for me, failure has a tendency to grind me to a halt. For Earl Thomas, Failure has a tendency to propel him forward, and it's all in perspective. Perspective changes everything. <laughs> For David, um, perspective changes everything, too. The situation of David and Goliath, um, absolutely, uh, he sees things so differently, and I think it's a note that we can take. I think it's a way that we can actually do life. Um, so we're going to do it. If you have a Bible, turn to 1 Samuel 17. Um, I, it's sort of going to be like a tour guide ride. We're going to go through it, um, and uh, I'll read some verses, and then we'll we'll take a pause and, and check it out. Um, so let me let me start us off. Uh, the first ten verses of First Samuel seventeen. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Succoth in Judah, and they pitched camp at Ephes Demim between Soka and Azekah. And Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah, and they drew up their battle lines 
to meet the Philistines. And the Philistines occupied one hill, and the Israelites another, and there was a valley between them. And a champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. He was over nine feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. And on his legs he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin that was slung on his back, and his spear shaft was like a weaver's rod. And its iron point weighed 600 shekels. And his shield-bearer went ahead of him. And Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. And if he is able to kill me, we will become your subjects. And if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects. And then the Philistines said, This day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man, let us fight together. <coughs> so, um, picture. They're in a valley. One army on one side, one army on the other, and a big valley in the middle. Sort of like an amphitheater almost. And uh, anyone attacks anyone else and they give up the high ground. They're coming from below, there's going to be a massive loss on either of their hands. And so they resort to something historically of, of a champion battle. You send down one man, it's a way to avert a lot of bloodshed, have one champion come out and fight to see who's going to win uh, this, this battle. And the stakes are pretty high, I mean, slavery, basically, or at least uh, needing to give tremendous taxes and being subject to another kingdom. Um, and Goliath strides out, and uh, he's seven feet tall. He's got uh, 150 pounds, basically, worth of armor and uh, weapons on him. I couldn't even walk with 150 pounds of anything anywhere on me. And, um, and the only picture that I can think of is like Shaquille O'Neal or like an NFL lineman. I mean, when you watch them on TV... They're kind of like similar to the guys that they're across from, so they don't look that big. But if you ever like meet one of these guys, they're enormous, enormous. Or like Andre the Giant. I mean, this guy is huge, and he's well armed and he's trained. And the result uh, is what we see in verse eleven, which is on hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites are dismayed and terrified. Dismayed and terrified. Here they stand before an uncertain battle, an uncertain future, a challenge, an obstacle. And every morning and every evening for a month, it rears its head and shows up. And at some point, they're going to have to deal with it. We get our share of lives. There are things that will raise their heads again and again, and they terrify us. And they make our faith wither. And we don't know quite how to move through them or move forward. It can be a really big, scary thing. We all have our fears. Um, but it can also be something that just sucks the life out of us. It's, it's just something that, a piece of furniture kind of in our in our life that is just, it's there and we wish it was different. Um, or it can be a nudge that God's given us, like to step out in faith in some way or, or to have some crucial conversation with someone or to share our faith with someone and... Um, are we willing to risk it? And it's and it's daunting. I know for me, um, using my gifts is a tremendous test of this. I was I was driving here this morning thinking I wish Christina was in town because she always tells me it's going to be okay. You're going to preach fine. <laughs> um, and I was driving in going, man, I don't know if I can do this. <laughs> and, and remembering my first book report I ever gave in fourth grade, and I was <laughs> shaking like a leaf. And, I don't know if I even made it through the whole book report before I went and sat down. And um, yeah, this whole preaching thing, man, it's just scary. Um, Rick Warren actually has a hard time preaching for the first 10 minutes of his sermon. He just blacks out and can't see anything because he's so nervous. Um, so this using of our gifts, I think, can be a tremendously scary thing. Um, for me, I'm learning from John. He's always reaching out to people in a relationship and kind of extending himself and, and kind of inviting himself over into your life, if you've noticed that. And, um, man, I am trying to do that, but it is risky. I always fear about rejection. What if they say no? What if they don't want to meet with me? What if I waste their time? All these things pop up. Um, 
But it, the story says that if they would have lost to Goliath, they would have been stuck in slavery. And I think that's what happens when we don't move towards the Goliaths in our life. Is we get stuck. We get stuck in slavery and we're not able to move into this abundant life that God has for us and to do the things that God has for us. And so we settle for kind of sitting on a hillside. We manage sitting on a hillside. I just don't want to go down there and fight the Goliath. So I'm going to stay here on the hillside. But then you're, we're kind of stuck. Um, and that's where David steps in. Uh, David, this guy, little guy pops up in the story. And um, it's going to be kind of a longer section to read. But I want to read it all because I think the Bible is important. And it's great to hear from. So uh, I'm going to read... Uh, David's David's coming up on this scene and, and what he sees, and it's verses 12 through uh, 37. That's what we're going to read. Now David was the son of the Ephrathite named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem and Judah, and Jesse had eight sons, and in Saul's time he was old and well advanced in his years. And Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to the war. The first born was Eliab, the second was Abinadab, and the third was Shema. And David was the youngest. The three oldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father and sheep at Bethlehem. And for forty days the Philistines came forward every month and every or every morning and every evening and took his stand. Now Jesse said to his son David, Take this ephah of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. Take along these ten cheeses and give them to the commander of the unit and see how your brothers are doing and bring back some assurance from them. There was Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. And early in the morning, David left the flock with the shepherd, loaded up, set out as Jesse directed, and he reached the camp of the army that the army was going out to its battle positions, shouting their war cry. And Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines facing each other. And David left his things with the keeper of supplies, and he ran to the battle lines and greeted his brothers. And as he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. And when the Israelites saw this man, they all ran from him with great fear. Now the Israelites had been saying, Do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel, and the king will give great wealth to any man who kills him. He will also give his daughter in marriage and will exempt his father's family from taxes in Israel. And David asked the man standing near him, What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who's the uncircumcised Philistine that he would defy the armies of the living God? And they repeated to him what they had been saying and told him, This is what will be done for the man who kills him. And when Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the man, he burned with anger at him and said, Why have you come down here? And with whom did you even leave our sheep in the desert? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You just came down here to watch a battle. Now what have I done, said David? I can't even speak. <laughs> and he then turned away to somebody else, and he brought up the same matter and got the same answer as before. And what David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. And David sent, said to Saul, Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. By the way, Saul should have been the one down there fighting him. I'm sure he was greatly relieved to have a shepherd boy stepping up and being willing to take this hit for him. Um, and Saul replied, You're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him because you're a boy. And he has been fighting, he's been a fighting man since his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, I struck it, and I rescued the sheep from its mouth. And when it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, and I struck it, and I killed it. Your servant has killed both lions and bears. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And so Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. So King Saul, he looks down and he sees Goliath is really big. He's been fighting for longer than David's been alive. And he says, David, you are extremely small. You're a boy. You can't go fight him. Uh, you're a shepherd. His brother, 
is going, dude, you just came here to watch a show. You like came to the fight, and that's all you want is to watch from the sidelines. You can't do this. Um, and as I kind of read this, I think this is how most of us view the world. We, we look at things and we kind of measure ourselves. We go, well, have I done that before? Um, could I do that again? Am I capable of this? And then we, if we decide that we're capable of it, we move into it. And if we decide that we're not capable of it, we don't necessarily move into it. Um, and we see the limitations. And I can't count the number of times that uh, I have chickened out on stuff. And I can come up with really good reasons for why it is. Um, talking with my grandfather this week about faith is incredibly challenging. He has never uh, shown any signs of believing. And he's coming up near the end of his life. And um, it is scary for me to talk to him. And, uh, and I kind of tell myself things like, well, maybe there'll be another time. Or... Um, or uh, I know over the years that Christine and I have faced challenges in terms of, uh, do we want to bring up doing family devotions again? How do we do that? Last time I tried it, it didn't work out very well because I tried to lead her on this very good historical Bible study and she was not a fan of that. So, <laughs> so well, but we want to do this together. It's, it's hard to step into that stuff. Um, and I notice that in these moments that I have a tendency to trust in myself. I say, okay, I can do this, and I can do this, and I can do this, and I'll do these things. And then only if something pops up that's out of the confines of my control, that's bigger than me, then I kind of go, well, God, could you do a little more than you usually do? I know you're usually back there pulling levers and moving knobs and keeping things on track in my life, but now I'd really like it if you could do something because I finally find myself in territory where I really need you. Um, everyone looks at David and says, David, that guy's so big, you can't, you can't face that. And um, David has a totally different perspective. He kind of goes, well, well, God's so big, how could I not face that? I mean, God's so big, how could that Philistine even possibly win? Um, and I love that in verse 34 to 37, David never once says, you know, look, at, I'm really fast. I, I'm, I'm a good shepherd, and look at what I can do with my stick. And <laughs> he doesn't start doing that, and that's how kind of how I would approach it. Okay, what, what skills do I have? How can, how can I do this? He doesn't share with Saul some master plan that he has for how he's going to take this guy down. Okay, so I'm going to run around behind him because he can't see behind him. He won't be able to track me. He doesn't do any of that. He simply knows from his life as a shepherd, from his relationship with God, that as he looks back, God has always been there. God has always delivered him. And he has faced things that would cause people dismay and terror. Lions and bears to a small shepherd boy, and yet God was there. For David, that's the bottom line. God is with us. We just celebrated it at Christmas. Emmanuel, God is with us. And really, the, the defining factor of our lives is not what we're facing or what we think we're capable of. The defining factor of our life is this. God is with you. What does he want us to do? And what is he capable of doing? That's it. That's the bottom line. That's the perspective shift. Um, and then it shifts from, can I face this to, am I available to God today as I go through this day? <coughs> Ephesians 2.10 talks about how we're God's workmanship, created in Christ to do good works that he's prepared in advance for us to do. And that implies that, that God has already been preparing situations and us to face them. And that's what we walk into each day. And I believe that to be a daily verse. Like, that's not just once in a while does God have something for us. Every time you run across somebody, God, well, God set this up. So, and he wants to do something, so here you are. Are you available? It doesn't matter how big or scary or intimidating it is if God is with us. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 talks about walking by faith, not by sight. And I think that's what it's talking about, is what are we focused on? When we're afraid, we can't focus on anything except for the thing we're afraid of or how small we feel compared to it. Those are the only two things when you're afraid that you'll be thinking about. When your focus is on faith, 
You're focused on how big is God? What has he done before? And what does that mean that he'll probably do now? It's a totally shift of an eye. Jesus' teachings on worry always make me really uncomfortable. You ever read that part? And you go, what on earth? That's irresponsible almost. Like, <laughs> why worry about what you're going to wear and what you're going to have? The lilies of the field are dressed better than Solomon ever was. You don't have to worry about that. I'm like, Jesus, what are you doing? That's irresponsible. That's not good management. Like, <laughs> But here's the thing. What Jesus looks at is, how precious are you? How big is God? How much does God love you? And then, so what does that all mean when it comes to stuff? You don't need to worry about your stuff. There's bigger things to worry about. Worry about being connected with God. It's a question of perspective. So I want to introduce for you a, uh, a new term. I grew up in the self-esteem generation. I was told, you can be anything. I found out I cannot be a Seahawk. <laughs> cannot be an NBA player. As a matter of fact, I cannot actually keep track of my work keys without a gadget from Christina to help me do so. So, apparently self-esteem is not really working for me right now. So I've adopted this thing called God Esteem. And for God Esteem, what I, what I think is, uh, how highly do I esteem God and, and what, does, what is he capable of doing? And therefore... What can I do as a result? So when I face things, now I'm starting to go, well, what could God do here? Hmm, let's step into it and see. Um, it's a total shift for me, and that's the shift that I think David takes. Um, David doesn't see a giant who can't be overcome. He sees a God who is faithful and powerful, and who will overcome this one. Um, there's one more kind of crucial twinge to the story that I want to bring up. And um, and that is that when David volunteered to face Goliath, Saul kind of said, hey, all right, we're going to get you into fighting shape as quickly as possible. I will put giant armor on you. I will give you a big sword, and then you will go down, and you will face this giant who's been training with his enormous weapon for years and years, and you're going to fight him. And we'll probably lose this, but at least it won't be me, so I guess go, David. <laughs> and David puts on the clunky armor, and he's plodding around, and he's like, man, this does not feel right. He says, I haven't tested this out. Like, this, this just feels foreign to me. And David goes, if i got to do this, i got to do it as myself. God made David just right for this task. Um, David insists on going without all that stuff. And I just got to read the end of the story. I know you already know it, but it's such a good ending. <laughs> Here's what it says. Um, um Verses 40 through 51. And then he took his staff in his hand and he chose five smooth stones from the stream and he put them in a pouch in his shepherd's bag and the sling in his hand and he approached the Philistine. And meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bare in front of him, kept coming closer to David. And he looked David over and he saw that he was a boy. He was ruddy and handsome and he despised him. And he said to David, Am I a dog that you come out at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods and said, Come here, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And then David said to the Philistine, You come against me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And this day the Lord will hand you over to me. I will strike you down, and I will cut off your head. Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. The whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And all those gathered here know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he's going to give you into my hands. And as the Philistines moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line. He reached into his bag, he took out a stone, he slung it,
and struck the Philistine on the forehead, and the stone sank into his forehead, and he fell down on the ground. And David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, without a sword in his hand. He struck down that Philistine and killed him. And then David ran over, stood over him. He took off the Philistine's sword, drew it from its scabbard, and after he killed him, he cut his head off with that sword. And when the Philistines saw their hero was dead, they turned and ran. So, David is a shepherd, and that's how he knows how to fight. And the crazy thing about uh, a shepherd was he knew how to use a sling. And um, I was doing some research on this, and it's, uh, it's known that guys could get that sling going. It was like a little, they whip around in a circle, and then they let go of one end of it. It wasn't like a slingshot. And uh, they could get that thing going about 100 miles an hour. So think NBA pitcher fastball. Um, and they could hit things from accurately from about 200 feet away. So David could have easily taken out Goliath from way further away than Goliath could have ever thrown that javelin even close to him. And uh, the equivalent is Goliath standing there with the sword and uh, David almost the same amount of force pulling out a 45 caliber pistol. And shooting him in the head. It's that kind of force. I mean, this was not even close. But had anybody gone down there with a sword and with an armor and fought it out, they probably would not have taken him. But instead, no one ever thought, well, let's send out a little shepherd who's good with a sling. But the sling was the perfect thing that was needed. And what this tells me is that God has prepared you and me for exactly what we're going to face in our life. You have been equipped through your life experience, through what you have already gone through, for exactly what you're going to face. And with God's help, you have the exact tools you need to walk into what God wants. So we have to be ourselves. There's this weird, funky thing that we do where we wish that we were somebody else, and I do it all the time. I wish I could play music like you, Dave. I cannot. He's heard me plunk on the piano. It's rough. Um, I honestly, I wish I was as handy as Richard or Chuck. I wish I had John's preaching abilities or his his ability to just gregariously take control of a room. Um, I wish I was half as good with kids as uh, as Alyssa or you, Linda, or. I look around, I see all these gifts, and I go, man, I'd be a better pastor if I had that one. (laughs) But the crazy thing is, I don't. I got me. And this passage reminds us, God gave you you, and 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 it's a pretty darn good you, and it's exactly what the world needs with the stuff that you're going to encounter. So, be yourself. It's necessary. We can't be it something else. And you might think, well, I'm not a great public speaker or a great prayer or I'm not very spiritual or whatever, but um, each of us have our gifts and we need to use them. All right, last last little bit. Uh, I ran across something called YBH. I try and leave something practical at the end because great ideas are helpful. And YBH stands for yeah, but how? Uh, Eugene Peterson writes it in lots of his books as he reads people's books. He goes, you know, that's a brilliant insight. <laughs> yeah, but how? Um, there's a there's a disconnect sometimes, and I think it happens a lot with sermons. So, so how do we step into this reality shift, uh, this perspective shift, um, and live by faith rather than by fear or by ourselves or whatever our default is? So, first one: look back, risk forward. Look back and see what God has brought you through. And remember that God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and forever. And he's going to do the same thing again. So risk forward. Second one, get focused before Goliath came. David wrote all those psalms. He was out there with his sheep, probably really boring times, being focused on God. And so when it came time to face Goliath, it wasn't like he had to draw on some new sort of skills that he had to have. Um, Come up with a simple routine, a simple way to get um, 
get focused on God before you face your Goliaths. I like early in the morning. Um, I like a, a little Celtic prayer about Christ is with me, he's in front of me, he's behind me, he's on my sides. Um, he's in the mouth of the people I'm going to speak to, he's in the ears of the people that I'm going to share with. And, and, um, and I change it up a lot, but I have something most mornings that gets me focused so that I can go through the day going, okay, God's already there. Um, and then the last one, uh, if I can find it, there it is. Um, lean into it. I don't think it was entirely comfortable for David to go down and face Goliath. We have this tendency to picture Jesus or Bible heroes as being like these awesome towers of faith and they never had any fear. And of course, as he went down there, he knew he was just going to pull out his sling and there was no threat from this giant Philistine because his faith was so strong. But I have yet to meet anybody who does faith like that. Um, it's uncomfortable. So lean into it. Kind of see, is God going to be here? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to test this out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a step. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try bringing up faith with that coworker and see what happens today. Um, I'm going to have that risky conversation. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and give a little bit more than I have been to this. Or... Uh, I'm going to risk going over to a neighbor and looking like a door for bringing in cookies just because I want to build relationships with them and serve them. Uh, maybe it's trying something new. Maybe it's trying something old that we gave up on because we figured that ship has sailed. But maybe it's time to try again. And whatever it is that God's nudging, lean into it. So, I have one more thing for us to do. Um, we're going to take the offering after I pray. Um, there's cards, little three by five cards that I have put on all the chairs. <coughs> I want to invite you to grab it, and I want to invite you to put on it either something that God is nudging you towards, or a Goliath that you may feel like you're facing. And then when we take the offering, I want to invite you to put it actually in the offering plate. Because um, it's going to be a symbolic way that we kind of hand this to God and recognize that this is his to deal with, that we'll partner with him in it, but that we would like to see him move in. Sound like a plan? All right. So let's pray. God, thank you for this encouraging story. Um, so often we see uh, ourselves as small. We're not all that different from David. We're just ordinary people who do ordinary things, and yet your kingdom seems to be extraordinary, and it's hard to see the things that we can tackle with your help. God, we all have things that bring about fear. We all have big obstacles, and some of them we haven't gone down to the floor of that valley to face um, with you, and so Lord, help us to do that. Go with us and give us the courage to step up and to see what you can do. God, we love you. We love you for your faithfulness and your goodness and your kindness to us. Help us to keep seeking that out and to keep risking enough to see that you are still there. We love you. Amen. Yeah.